them basically might have been drawn. And it's the same way if you come maybe like to the aisle and you buy a practice. If, you, if it looks like that, that box has already been opened, don't buy it. In fact, like I said, if you buy medicine in Walgreens, and usually, not all the time, but most of the time, there will be a caution either on the bottle or around it, and it will say, if the seal is broken or damaged in any way, don't use this product, but carry it back. Amen? Now, not only can goods be damaged, but people can be damaged the same way. Sin has damaged all of us. Even those of us who are saved by the grace of God, we're still damaged goods. But one thing that, and I was talking, I don't see the young lady this morning, uh, she came in the office and I was talking to her about her soul, and I was telling her that God has given us hope in the first letter of John and in the first chapter of that verse where he says, if we come to him or go to him, ask him for forgiveness, he is faithful, which means he keeps his word, and not only faithful, but he is just, he is right. And he will what? Forgive us for all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is a verse for all of us. For damage to our minds are damaged. Uh, I remember uh, this was years ago, I don't know in the seventies when Bill calls me for he had his uh, uh, had his special on. He had a one man show, a comedy show. He was, uh, that was, I think, the beginning of his career. And uh, he was just sitting on the stage, there was no background, nothing, just there. He was sitting on the stool, and he was just talking to everyone. And you've heard me make recent of this before, but I've never forgotten. And he got on the subject of his children. And I think at that particular time, his children were small, they were not grown. And uh, he used an example, he was talking about in terms of how kids, will do things and then they will try to pretend as though that they have not done it. And he said that his younger son at that time, his mother, had told them uh, going in the kitchen not to touch something. But anyway, the young child went in there and he got it and he broke whatever it was. And, uh, and, uh, and the child came to Bill Cosby and he was crying. And he was saying, Mama is going to punish me. So Bill Cosby, in his very uh, dry humor, said, well, he called his name, I don't remember, well, why did you do it? And he said, his son replied, I don't know. And then Bill Coffin said, that's what you call brain damage. That's brain damage, when you do something and you don't know why you're doing it. But you know what? If you take that illustration and you cast it over a center, a sinner can say the same thing. I don't know why I do some things. And it's because sin has damaged our minds, our psyche, our souls. This verse of scripture, John 3.16, is, we can say, one of the best known and most often texts that preachers have preached on over the years in the entire Bible. This verse John 3.16 is a moving summary of the gospel of Jesus Christ that you will find in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and the first five verses. It is cast in the terms of the love of God. God's love, as we know, was present in the prologue of John's gospel. And if you turn back, chapter 1, verse 1, where John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is Jesus Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, the beginning, with us having finite minds, and not the 
not able to comprehend like God does or not having his wisdom. For us, a beginning means something or somebody has to start. There has to be a start from somewhere, a point of entrance into life. But when we say that God has no beginning, that's by God. We can't understand that. Because when we came in this world, everything we saw started from something, right? Whether it was trees, whether it was plants, whatever it might have been, grass, we did, we started from something. We came out of the womb of our mothers. But God has never had a beginning. And you said, preacher, that, 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 that does not make logical sense. Well, that's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning. Now, the beginning is not referring to when God had started, but when God decided he was going to initiate his what? His creation, his action of creating that which we see now. This verse in John 3, 16 refers to the grace of God that was brought by the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, in chapter 1, verse 12. Now, this 16th verse traces back to the ultimate origin of Jesus Christ. If you turn to John chapter 17, verse 4, Jesus Christ is in the upper room with his disciples a few hours before his crucifixion. And he is praying. This is what we call one of the greatest prayer, or the term has been given the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. He's praying for his disciples. He's praying for us. He's praying for the whole world. And he says in that fourth verse of that 17th chapter, and I'm praying, paraphrasing this, he says, Father, glorify me now with the glory that I had with you at the beginning, at the start, when there was nothing but cosmos, there was no universe, there was no stars, no moon, no sun, there was nothing. You and I were there. We were being glorified together. Lord, give me, Father, give me back that glory that I had with you from the start. Now, when we dissect this verse, let's look at it for some basic understanding of the conversation because really, this verse is an extension, uh, and I'm going to use the phraseology of Dr. Boyd. This verse, this verse is a connectedness from the beginning of chapter 3 with Jesus talking with Nicodemus, and he makes also this statement to Nicodemus when he tells him, you mean to tell me you are a learned man, you are a scholar, you know the Mosaic law, you have studied scriptures, you possibly memorize everything, and you don't understand in terms of what I'm telling you. Then he goes on to tell him, after the incident in the wilderness with Moses and the people, for God what? So love the world damaged goods that what? He gave. What did he give? Why did he give? He loved them. That what? Who so? Which means that by faith I receive him, I accept him. If I do that, I shall not what? Perish. Now, we'll get to that in a few minutes. But obviously, also in this verse, everybody does not receive Jesus Christ. He says, for those who do receive me. Let's continue. First of all, John started out by saying, for God. Let's just use that, uh, let's use his name. When we hear the word God, what do we think about? At least, I think about the sovereignty of God. I think about the power of God. I think about the wisdom of God. I think about God being everywhere at the same time. I think about God's mercy, his grace, 
I think about God's compassion, his long suffering, his patience, his insight. I think about him being in control of everything in this world, in my life and your life, that he knew it was going to happen before it happened, and he knows what the outcome is going to be before, he, before it even gets started. Amen? Amen. So the sovereignty of God for God, God has no beginning. He has no end. God is self-existing. We look at this and we know that God does not need anything, nor anybody, nor any help from anyone to remain God or to continue to exist as God or to operate as God. Let me say it another way. God was God before you and I were born, and after we are dead and gone, he will still be the same God. He didn't need us before we got here. He uses us while we're here, and when we are gone, he'll get somebody else. Do we understand that? The speaker told us last week, none of us in that 12th chapter of Romans is what? Indispensable. All of us are what? Disposable. You know what disposable things are? Phone plates, paper cups, napkins, uh, medicine, uh, hypodermic needles. These are things you throw away. Amen? Or we cast them away. So, John says, for God, then he says, for God so, don't go any further, and stop at that small word, S-O, so. Do you know what that word means? That word, so, means here that John is implying the extent of God's activity. He is stating now that God is getting ready to do something. There will be a consequence of his love. There will be a result of him being God, and he's now ready to do something. For God, what? So, he's getting ready to initiate uh, his authority, his power, his decision, what he wants to do, coming out of the bowels, what? Of his own love. For God, so, now, in your Bible, I mean, I want to do this, but if I were you, I would put a circle around L-O-V-E, love. And scripture never talks about physical love. It never gives the love of God in the context of filial love, brother love, friend love, parent to child love, sexual love, no, no. The love that scripture gives is what the Greek term says, agape, which is full, complete love. It is a love that doesn't begin, well, let me see, let me say this right. It is a love that is given not because the recipient of the love did something for the giver. It is a love that doesn't base its giving on how the receiver acts toward the giver. It is a love that does not become disgusted, bitter, nor angry with the person that it is loving. Recipient 
of the receiver of the love, whether that person is good or bad or indifferent, rotten, low down, God so loves. And he doesn't define the person that he loves. He doesn't give parameters or stipulations in terms of, now, these are the kind of people that I'm going to love. I'm going to love good folk. I'm going to love people that are lovable. I'm going to love folk that, that are going to love me back. I'm going to love folk that are desirable, that are attractive in their physical appearance. I'm going to love folk that have a good heart. He doesn't, he doesn't define, nor does he give any definite guidelines in terms of who he's going to love. He says, for God so loved, and we'll get to it in terms of the rest of this verse. This love is a penetrating love. It is an everlasting love. It is a love that doesn't run out. You know, in human relationships, sometimes our love runs out. Though. We know it should. But it does. Sometimes parents will give up on their children. And they will say, okay, that's their problem. The H-E-L-L with me. Amen. He never heard a parent say that. All oh, y'all must have been around grateful all your life. Where y'all been? Y'all always start to walk up among the masses around folk that ain't good church folk. You know, people that talk differently, that act differently. Amen. Our love gets weary. Our love gets tenuous and thin. And even the kind of love between a husband and wife can be so strained until it breaks. And that's what the legal system calls what? Divorce. Amen? 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 But God's love remains what? Constant, right? The same. Even when I want to divorce him, he won't divorce me. When I get mad with him, he's patient with me. When I tell him, step back in the line of my priorities and go back down to number 10, he won't walk away and say, okay, if that's your decision, I'm giving up on you. You're not worth all of the effort that I'm trying to, that I'm uh, using in your life, trying to make you a better person. If you want to go to hell, you go to hell. That's your decision. He's still there. Still there. And one thing that we know about God, God is not a God of one chance. Let me say it again. He doesn't say one strike and you're out. He doesn't say two strikes, you're out. He doesn't even say three strikes, you're out. Because most of us on the third strike, that's it, honey child, no more. I can't put up with it no more. But if you come to him again in chapter one, the epistle, first letter of John, the ninth verse. If you come to him, what? And ask for forgiveness. What will he do? He's patient. He's faithful. He's just to what? To forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. John says here that the nature of God, the being of God, the mindset of God, causes him to think about you and me, what? All the time. We are constantly in the thought and in the heart of God. God so loved. First of all, we see here the unfathomable 
depth of God's love. Unfathomable, U-N-F-A-T-H-O-M-A-B-L-E. You know what a phantom means, don't you? That's a cold weather capsule. You still shoot it? Jesus Christ. The word unfathomable means that you cannot get down to the source of it. You can't understand all the ramifications of God's love. You don't know where it started. You don't know why it began. And you don't even know in terms of the direction that his love is going. That's the reason why with Nicodemus, he used the human illustration of wind blowing. And he said, Nicodemus, tell me, where did the wind come from? He wasn't talking about direction. He was talking about in terms of the source of the wind. Nicodemus says, I don't know. Well, what direction is it going? Where is it going? I don't know. But how do you know that the wind is here then? He says, I feel it. I feel it blowing what? On my face. Well, even though you don't know the origin of it, you don't know the end of it, but you know the wind is real because you physically feel it. That's the same way it is with the power of God and with the Holy Spirit. You don't know where he came from. You don't know his work, how he's doing it, but you know deep down in your soul, you know the Holy Spirit is real. You know he's real. And I don't care what anybody says, I am a living, testifiable witness to the Holy Spirit. When he gets ready to tap into you, I don't care how you resist him, I don't care in terms of how you try to run away, or you try to get your mind on something else. When he wants to invade you, he will do it. Jonah tried to do that. Remember God told Jonah to go where? To Nineveh. But Jonah said, oh, no, I ain't gonna, no people don't deserve you, Lord. They're mean. They are barbaric folk. And I hope all of them die and go to H-E-L-M. So Jonah decides he's gonna do things his way, and he goes what? In the opposite direction, going toward what? Tarshas. But God, in essence, says, okay, you disobey me. You're going to try to do it your way. I'm going to show you I'm God. And I don't care in terms of how arrogant and stubborn and proud you are. You're going to do my will my way. And I don't have time to go into the rest of the story. But when God got through with Jonah, <laughs> you, you know what Jonah did, don't you? He went to Nineveh and he preached the word of God. I remember <clears throat> my third, my junior year, when I was in college, I had my plans. My plans. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, what I was going to do. What I wanted to do with my life. The direction I wanted to go. And I thought I had everything in my box. And all I had to do was just turn the key and everything would just flow evenly. But the Lord had other plans. Now, I wasn't aware of these other plans now. I knew nothing about his plans in my life. But I do know this, that the Holy Spirit started invading my mind. And I started feeling uncomfortable. Then I started questioning, maybe this ain't what I'm supposed to do. Then I started feeling uncomfortable about my plans. Then I started feeling really mixed up and confused, and then all of a sudden, a wave came over me and I felt as though, this ain't it. Well, what do I do? When God got through with me, I didn't know whether I was going up, down, out, in, sideways, whatever it was. And I couldn't understand the, uh, the disquietness in me. I couldn't understand in terms of the, disrupt, the disruption in my spirit. I couldn't understand in terms of why all of a sudden now, before, I had a certainty in my life. 
I knew what I wanted to do. I had my plans laid out. Now, I don't know anything no more. It was just like the Lord stepped in and confused and turned every, every directional sign in my life, turned it in another direction. And I called him, I remember so vividly, one Thursday night, I was living off campus. And some of you possibly, I've, I've told you this before, but later I was staying with about 12 midnight. I decided that I was tired of being tired. Everybody understand what I'm trying to say? Have you ever been tired of being tired? If you haven't reached that juncture, honey child, you ain't ready for God to come in and to make you the vessel that you want to be. But I was tired of being tired. So, so the Holy Spirit said, call your father and talk with him and see what advice and insight he gives you. Well, to sum it up, he told me to read the eighth chapter of Romans. And I said to him, I said, well, what does that have to do with my indecision now? He said, just read it and give particular attention to verse 26. And that's the reason why that has become my favorite verse now. And we know, we are not guessing, we know that what? Everything works together for the good of those what? That love the Lord and are called what? According to his purpose. And the Holy Spirit said, all you got to do, get on your knees and confess to the Lord, yeah, I've been stupid, stubborn, proud, but I realize that for some reason things ain't going my way. So Lord, I surrender to you. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And do you know what some folk will say, well, he's just saying that to impress me. But this is reality. When I get on my knees and pray that prayer and surrender to God and turn it loose, and I said, Lord, I got a feeling, I know what you want me to do, but I don't want to do it. But if this is what you want, I will surrender to your will. And it was just like a ton of bricks had been lifted from my spirit. And immediately at that moment, I knew what direction my life must go. For God so loved the world, his unfathomable love. In this statement, as I said, we cannot understand it. We cannot fathom the meaning of his love. We cannot even dissect the nature of God. For God in his love gave up somebody. And who was that somebody he gave up? His son Jesus. Anybody ever heard that name? Anybody know who Jesus is like that song says? The illusion that John gives us here, you have to go back to Genesis. And you have to look at the foreshadowing of Abraham and Isaac. And you remember God had told Abraham that I want you to take what? Your son. And scripture is very definite. Your only son. And notice here, for God so loved the world that he gave what? His only son. I, uh, Abraham, I want you to take your only son, Isaac, take him to a designated place, and I want you to sacrifice him. Now, what if Abraham had said, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. Uh, my wife and I, we've been waiting over 20 some years for this child. And now you're going to take him away. Have you ever, have you ever questioned God about giving you a blessing and then look like he was taking that blessing away? Have you ever questioned God? Have you ever asked him, well, Lord, I know you gave me this. Now, why would you take this away? Now, we know on this side, folks, that God was not looking for Abraham to take the life 
of Isaac, your son. What God was testing that Abraham found out later wrong. I want to see where your heart is. I want to see in terms of who in your life really means the most to you. Is it Isaac or is it me that gave you Isaac? God in all of our lives at times will test our total allegiance to him. And our Isaacs can be anything. It doesn't have to be an individual. It can be your job. It can be your position. It can be in terms of your mental acumen. Whatever it is, he does not want anything or anybody to be put above him when it comes to loyalty and commitment. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now let me tell you something else. If you try to put anything before him, he will give you time to try to straighten it out. But if you don't, he will remove whatever your eyes are in. In the sixth chapter of Isaiah, put it out here, said, in the year of what? That King Hosea lived longer, received a PhD. In the year that King Hosea said, I love you, he was baptized. No, in the year that the king what? Died. When he died, what happened? I saw the Lord. Obviously, Isaiah had a problem. He might have loved the king. He might have been so loyal and devoted to him until all he could see was a king. And you know what? That's not, that's not strange theology. Let me say this enough. Just about food. That's not strange theology. Unwittingly and unknowingly, that could be a person in your life that your faith is based on their faith and you don't know that your faith is standing on their faith. Did you know that? The only way that your faith can grow and get strong, not all the time, but many times God will have to move that person. For you to stand on faith in him and not to stand on your faith through them. Does that make sense? We'll say amen. amen. Now, I don't think that I'm going to examine. Because I know that I, I mean, uh, that I see it. It happened to me. You can think so much of a person. You can love them so tenaciously until without being aware of it, they will cloud your vision of God. For God so loved the world that he gave. If the depth of God's love is measured by the value of his gift, then his love is greater than all of our loves put together. If the, if the gift is of eternal value, and if you measure the gift according to the person that gave it, then you would have to say, that person's heart is, they have a big heart, right? If you measure Jesus Christ, who came from the heart of his father, and if you look at all that he did, and the father gave him, then what does that say about the father? That he's a great man, isn't he? That he's a great God. That he would think that much about you and me. He gave, he gave the only, the most precious gift that he had, and what was that gift? Jesus Christ. In other words, when we look into the face of Jesus, we see his Father. For Christ said that when you see me, you see my Father. You 
remember years ago, Hallmark uh, Company, uh, they print Hallmark cards. You know, you've heard of Hallmark cards, haven't you? And when they were trying to get on their feet, and when they were trying to get into the billion category, they had a slogan. Remember what the slogan was? That you care enough to send the very best. That they were talking about their hallmark call. Not only the paper was printed on, but the message that was inside of the card, they claimed was different and better than the cards that were made by any other company. Well, Hallmark, the cards are good, I admit, but the gift that God sent, Hallmark cards can compare with Jesus Christ. No, no, no way. For we can say the same thing about the Father. He cared enough for you and me, what? To send the very best. Next we see here an all-inclusive scope of God's love. An all-inclusive scope of God's love. God not only loves Israel, but his love is an indiscriminate love. He loves every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. The type of love that God has, it is an embracing love. And the object of his love is what? The world. For God so loved what? The world. And the world has got everything in it. And if we look at the world today, we would have to be honest and we would have to be straightforward and say that some of the people in this world, how can God love them? The serial killer, the rapist, you go on and on and on. But God so loved what? The world. Now look at who he loves. A fallen world. A mean world. A rebellious love world, rather. A wicked world. A world that's in darkness. A world that, that is in sin. Now lastly, he lavishes his love on these kind of people. Well, what should be the response of the world to God's gift of Jesus Christ? The response comes twofold. It can either be yes or no. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him believes on his name, what? Shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. John tells us in his prologue in chapter 1, Jesus, when he came into this world, he brought what? Light. And he is that light that shines in the midst of darkness. Sin is equated with darkness. But John tells us in that first chapter, the light came into the darkness. The darkness could not comprehend the light, but the light what? Subdued the darkness, won the victory, but the darkness what? Still refused what? To relinquish its authority. Now let's look at that from the standpoint of what John tells us in, uh, in the book of Revelation. Darkness representing the enemy of God. We know that when Jesus came, he gave what? He gave the option, he gave the decision. You can accept me, follow me, love me, you can serve me, or you can decide what? To do your will, your way. You can continue to be damaged, you can continue to be what? Me. Arrogant, but there, there is a response to both of those what reactions. 
If you receive me, you receive what? Life, love, understanding, eternal life. You enter into my kingdom. If you refuse what I have brought, then what is what? What is the decision that the behavior for you? Eternal darkness. Eternal damnation. Now, light forces darkness to make a decision. Light creates a crisis. For light and darkness cannot exist together as a couple in the same place. Let me say it again. Light and darkness cannot exist. Let me say it another way. They cannot coexist. They cannot cohabitate together in the same place. It's either going to be light all over the house or darkness all over the house. Amen? Then I hope that we can turn on the lamp and the lamp can illuminate a little bit and dispel a little bit of the darkness. But if you want the house to be illuminated throughout, you have to turn on what? All the light. Because if not, if you turn on one or two, that darkness ain't going to run away because of one night being on, right? The rest of it will be around the light. But there will be darkness in other areas of the house. When Jesus came into this world, he came into a world of what? Darkness. A world of sin. Where men hated one another. Killed one another despise one another, use one another. That sounds familiar, don't it? Because the same thing is happening right there in the world today. But, like it was then, it exists now. Jesus Christ can come into the life of anybody right now. And the same way in that day and time, when he was rejected, because we know that when they nailed him to that timber and they put spikes in his hands and they put a spike in his feet, what, what did the world do to him? They what? They spat on him. They ridiculed him. They said, if you be the son of God, if you claim to be who you say that you are, well, with your power, just come on down from the cross. You won't have any problem. If you are so powerful, one of the thieves said, come down, save yourself, save us with yourself. If you are the light, if you are the Son of God. But what did the light say to the darkness that was ridiculing him and spitting on him? He said, Father, forgive them. For what? They know not what they are not only doing, but they don't even understand what they are saying. They don't know why they are saying it. They don't even know why they hate me. They don't even know me. And men and women have the same attitude toward Jesus Christ right now. They claim that he is what? A great teacher. A great prophet, but he's much more than a teacher and a prophet. If the only thing when he came was to teach certain different tenets or to be a great prophet, then all of our faith is what? In vain. He died. How many of you know that he died? Do you know that he died because? He said he died, or the gospel writer said that he died, or did he die in your soul? Did he die for your sins? 
did he die for your iniquities? Did he die for you? Dying is great, but living is great. And as I conclude, I'm concluding with this. If he had not gotten up out of the grave, his death would not have meant anything. Do you know that? Everybody dies. Mohammed died. Confucius died. Founders of many religions have died. But none of them has gotten up out of that grave yet. Right? And not only did he get up out of the grave, he even predicted before he died how long he would stay in his grave. And he chose his own grave. And he chose the ones that were going to be there with him at his grave. And when he got up on that third day, even those that he loved, they could not believe their minds were blown. They could not accept the fact that he's alive. But we know what they didn't understand. You can't kill God. You can't kill the unkillable. Is that, is that such a word that I can use? Unkillable. You can't kill God. He still reigns, what? Forever and ever. For God so loved the world, he did something about his love. He gave. Did he give an inferior gift? His only precious son. Why? That whoever, whomever, believes in Jesus Christ, what will be the outcome? They will not perish, but they will have eternal life. And then the opposite. If I don't believe in Jesus Christ, then I will be condemned to God's judgment. For God. So love the world he gave. The question is, we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. We claim to serve him. Is that right? Yes, Are we loving the way that he loves? Are we indiscriminate to people the way he was? Do we love the game bangers? Do we love the people over there on Newberry Terrace? When somebody comes into this church smelling clothes nasty, they're disheveled. Do we look at them with disdain? Or do we go to them? with a smile and say to them, we welcome you, we're glad you are here. Or do we pass by them with a snarl like they did Jesus on the cross and look down upon them as if to say, they're nothing but dirt. We can call ourselves Christians, 